Please stand as we sing together in Psalm 100, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. for me to preside over this first convocation in my experience and to begin our academic year together. It's always a special joy to see our students gather together, some of whom I'm just meeting, and it's an honor to be joined this evening by several guests as well. There are a number of people who deserve thanks for an evening like this. I want to single out just a few for special gratitude. First of all, we do thank our friends here at Covenant Community OPC. We are grateful for the use of this facility and for their hospitality in so many ways. We also are grateful and want to recognize the Student uh, Body Association for all their logistical work in putting this evening together. And then we'd also like to thank Rob Dykes for his work on the program and at the piano, Maddie Bulliard as well. All our work here at the seminary is very consciously carried out in the face of God. We're in His presence in all that we do. We're under His authority in all that we teach and in all that we say. And so it's only fitting on a night like this when we are beginning a new academic year that we begin our time together with prayer and with the reading of Scripture. This evening, our scripture reading will be uh, given by Dr. Dyer, and prior to that, Dr. Morales will open our time in prayer. Join me in prayer. O oh, great and eternal triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we adore, bless, and worship your holy name. You are the fountain of life. You are the source of every good gift and blessing, and we gather together in your presence through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we call upon you, for there is no other. We call upon you to be among us by your Spirit, to bless us with communion and fellowship with you, O God, and with the saints, with one another. We pray for your blessing on the reading and preaching of your word. Lord, we pray for your blessing 
on the semester, on the students, their studies, their families, their labors in the world and in the church. And all these things we ask for in the merit of our resurrected Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The scripture, the text this evening comes from Isaiah 66, verses 18 through 24. Please give your undivided attention to the reading of this portion of God's holy, infallible, and inerrant word. For I know that... O Lord God, we lift our eyes unto you as a servant to his master the handmaiden to our mistress. We open wide our mouths, Lord, that you might now fill them with good things from your word. And that we will confess it's been good for us, Lord, to be together. That we might see your beautiful, resplendent glory. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I imagine that... Um, Many, if not all of us, have had the experience of starting something with great enthusiasm and not finishing. Perhaps you were running a race and you were, the adrenaline was up and you took off running like a jackrabbit and you were like a tortoise by the time, if you even finished. You started well, but you, you couldn't finish. You went for a hike in nearby mountains full of energy and you take off at a brisk pace and suddenly you're flagged out at two-thirds of the way up the mountain. Or maybe it was a project uh, around the house, something you were doing, had a lot of enthusiasm, and after a few frustrations and busted fingers, you gave up. Uh, most of us experience the reality of starting fast and not finishing well. Now that is a problem in the Christian life, isn't it? Uh, you could probably remember, some of you, when you were first converted, the great enthusiasm you had, and then when reality sets in, and you begin to lag and even, uh, even backslide. It's true in the ministry. I read statistics yesterday that uh, the average is 30 to 40 percent of ministers are out of the ministry in five years. One denomination reported 70 percent of their ministers were out of the ministry in 10 years. These are abysmal statistics. As we sit here tonight, you've got the enthusiasm, my friends. For another year before, you've probably got all the, already forgotten about all the pain uh, from last year. And uh, you are ready to go. You're excited. You're starting your course of study. And somewhere along the way, financial problems, marriage difficulties, children problems, work problems, church problems, and you begin to wonder, why did I even do this? You know, or can I do this? And Do I have gifts to do this? And uh, it's all the more serious then when you go into the ministry. You've got your eye on that, most of you, as we're here tonight. And you're excited about that, and that will sustain you a good bit through your trials. But uh, when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, and you're there... Um, how are you going to keep going? Well, I want to talk to you tonight from this last paragraph of the prophet of Isaiah about the uh, goal and confidence of the new covenant minister. It's a grand ending to this most wonderful book, isn't it? That first half of Isaiah deals with uh, the Assyrian judgment and uh, uh, God's dispersing the northern kingdom, and yet woven all through it, as you well know, are these great uh, offers of grace and, and, of course, the beautiful revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's the second half, written by the same person, beginning in chapter 40, where now the prophet is doing a very complex thing. And sometimes, perhaps, the first few times you've read the book, you realize because he is predicting something that's not going to take place for, what, another 150 or so years the captivity by the Babylonians. But he's also predicting the return from captivity uh, at the end of the 70 years. 
And then through that, he's showing us that the captivity and its judgment and return are in fact picture and type of what God will do uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ and in the New Covenant. You come to that climax of the servant passages, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12. Most fantastic description of the work of the Savior. Chapter 54 then with the church, how that's part of God's overall eternal plan for gathering elect. 55, uh, the great gospel call with the promise that God's word does not return void. 56, even eunuchs and uh, aliens will be incorporated into the church of God and given an inheritance. Of course, the, the grand chapter on the Sabbath. But from about 58 to the end of the book, uh, Isaiah alternates between reproving the hypocrites who are in, will be in judgment and who will come back and talking about the grace of God to the faithful. And all that comes now to a, a glorious climax in this last uh, paragraph of the book of Isaiah. So I want to show you tonight for your encouragement that in this paragraph, uh, God is promising to provide new covenant pastures through whom he will gather and build and protect his church unto eternity. He's going to provide new covenant pastors who will gather, build, and protect his church to eternity. So we have there the goal of our lives, of our ministry, and that is this promise that God is going to gather uh, from the nations, his new covenant church. And then we have the confidence that God, through a new covenant ministry, is going to build and protect that church unto eternity. We begin in verse 18 then with this promise uh, that God is going to gather from the nations, his new covenant church. And that's a very interesting introduction. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. Now perhaps your Bible has a number of footnotes there. It's one of the most difficult um, clauses uh, in, in Hebrew, in the, in the book of Isaiah, because the verb know is not there. It's very abrupt, you see. So it's literally, uh, I, their works, and their thoughts, it is coming. Now what in the world is God saying there? Now, the, the no comes from the Septuagint. It's probably one of the better ways to, to fill in the blank. But as God has contrasted the hypocrites who have not been purged in judgment, and those who have, I believe he's coming here to a very positive statement of the perfection or the completion of judgment. Much the same way he began in chapter 40. You've paid double for your sins. Or Jeremiah puts it very aptly in chapter 50. In those days and at that time declares Jehovah, search will be made for the iniquity of Israel, but there'll be none. And for the sin of Judah, but they'll not be found. For I will pardon those whom I leave as remnant. I know their thoughts. I know their words. What he's saying is, I have purified them. They've paid double for their sins. I've purged their hearts by grace, and they're ready now to bring back to the land, to have this remnant that will, God will bring back to the land. But you'll see the purpose of bringing this remnant back to the land is that a time was coming now through the gathering of the remnant to begin gathering all nations and tongues to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to gather the nations, he promises, through the remnant that he brings back to Jerusalem. And the nations shall come and see my glory. You know, that's what the gospel really is all about, isn't it? Yes, we want to see people converted. We love our neighbor. But the gospel primarily is about the manifestation of the glory of God. You need to keep that in mind as you live your Christian life, as you prepare for ministry, as those of us who are in ministry are pursuing the ministry. It's all about the glory of God. Let that mark your studying, your living. Let it mark your teaching. And particularly, let it mark your preaching. That the nations will come to see the glory of God. Well, on the basis of that promise, he, he, he talks about the manner of this gathering. How's it going to be done? 
And he says in verse 19, I will set a sign among them and will send survivors from them to the nations. Tarshish, Put, Lud, Meshech are shooting the bow, uh, Tubal and Javan, to the distant coastlands that have neither heard my fame nor seen my glory, and they will declare my glory among the nations. So God says here that out of the remnant, notice the survivors, out of the survivors, he's going to send forth messengers. And they're going to the Gentile world. Now, the commentators are not able to identify even geographically all these places. And I mentioned you can translate Meshach as Meshach or the shooting of the bow. Uh, but, but the intent is clear, isn't it? I think it's Young who says from in the north, from east to west, from the south to west to east, all the nations of the earth are going to be gathered into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. These nations who have not heard of the glory of God. God is going to gather them to himself. Now, one of the insights into the fact that it's all the nations is this last reference here to the coastlands. It's a very technical phrase. Uh, for example, in Isaiah 24, 15, therefore glorify, therefore glorify Jehovah in the east, the name of Jehovah, the God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea. 60 verse 9. Surely the coastlands will wait for me. The ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of Jehovah your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. So God is saying that he is going to send out now from the remnant a group of the first missionaries, so to speak, to the nations. He brought them back, he trained them through those few hundred years, and we think then about the early missionaries, uh, the apostles, the 70 witnesses, as they began to preach Christ. We hear, we think about Stephen, Philip going to a Gentile, and of course the, the number one missionary when we think about Gentiles, in fact, is the Jew, the Apostle Paul, another one who's been saved from the remnant and sent out, sent out from them. He's going to gather, the, the early gathering shall take place through these Jewish missionaries. Look as well at their message. He says that he's going to send them out, the survivors among the nations, and they will declare, the last part of verse 19, they will declare my glory among the nations. Again, we come back to this. What's the gospel? It's, it's, it's the revelation of the glory of God. Psalm 96, 3. Tell of his glory among the nations. That's picked up in Revelation chapter 14, uh, where the angelic messengers, the preachers, go out, and their message of the gospel is, fear God and give him glory. That is to be our message, because the glory of God is revealed in the gospel. When Paul says, I determined no nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. To, to know Jesus Christ is to know the triune God. He's a revelation of God. We have God placarded before us and all of the splendor and beauty of his attributes and of his, of his great work and all that he is and does. And Christ has come to reveal him to us that God then is glorified in this revelation of God incarnate. And of course, the great cross work of Christ, the very means of redemption who else could have designed such a plan? Such a glorious scheme of salvation in which the just God can justify the wicked sinner. Oh, the gospel. Be gripped by it. The gospel is the revelation of the glory of God. Isaiah also tells us something here about the time, the formal inauguration, so to speak, of this missionary enterprise, as you look then um, at verse 20, well, still, still in our verse, the first part of 19, I will set a sign among them. Another confusing thing. What is this sign? Some have thought, well, this is the, the battle flag or the signal, but sign is usually this particular word is accompanied with great covenant transactions. Sign of the rainbow, the sign of circumcision. Uh, some suggest that the sign is Christ incarnate. And that begins to move in the right direction. 
But in fact, I believe I can show you from the text, the sign is Christ exalted and on Pentecost pouring out the Holy Spirit. Now you look at that. Oh, come on now. Where in the world? Well, let's go back to these strange names about which we don't know all the geographical locations. But what we do know, if you would go over to Genesis chapter 9 and 10, that the list of nations that Isaiah gives us here are the descendants of Japheth with a couple of Shemites who were not in Israel, like Lud. These are the ones that are going to be gathered according to the promise then. So that's in verses 2 and following of Genesis 10. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. And then we have Lud, as I mentioned. We've got Tarshish here in this list. But you go to chapter 9. As Noah prophesies the future of the church. And he says, may God enlarge Japheth, verse 22, and let, 27, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Now in Isaiah chapter 54, uh, the prophet has already told us to expand the tent, uh, lengthen the cord, strengthen it, because of this great um, exodus, or entrance now, of Gentiles into the church. Now, I said I can prove this is Pentecost, because then we go to Acts chapter 2, and we look at the list that's given to us there of the people that were gathered and converted on the day of Pentecost. And they represent the nations of the earth. Well, they, all, they all might have been either already converted, or, or Jews, or God-fearers, but when the, in chapter 2 they begin to describe those who hear the word of God in their own language. Um, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking. Here at Pentecost, the curse of Babel is overthrown. And God now begins to gather the nations unto himself through these Jewish apostles of whom he has spoken in this verse. And then what's the consequence of this great ingathering of Jew and Gentile into the church? Well, we read them in the next verse. Verse 20, they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to Jehovah on horses, in chariots, in litters, on mules, and on camels to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says Jehovah, just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of Jehovah. Now, there's two figures here that teach us that what God is doing is breaking down that middle wall of partition. In the first place, notice what he calls the converts. You're going to bring your brethren. It's not simply Jewish brethren. It's all those whom the Holy Spirit has incorporated at that point into the church and throughout the rest of the history. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And these Jewish missionaries are going to be bringing them to the church, Jerusalem, symbol there for the church, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the second figure here that shows what God is doing is that they're referred to then as acceptable offerings. They're going to bring their converts as a grain offering to Jehovah. And it's acceptable. It's coming now to the Lord God. This is why Paul so often refers to his own ministry as that of a priest, of presenting this sacrifice of Gentile converts unto God. Pentecost itself was the feast of first fruits. It's quite possible the last phrase in verse 20 can refer to the first fruits now of the gospel harvest. It says they're going to bring these grain offerings in a clean vessel. And I've read that the, clean, the only offering brought in clean, purified vessels was the offering of the first fruits. And so we see here that these are the first fruits of the gathered church that God began to gather to himself, beginning at Pentecost, now continuing since then. 
You see that middle wall of petition of which Paul uh, wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 is declared here with the language of acceptable offering and of brothers and sisters uh, together in Christ. When uh, Paul reminds uh, the Philippians of what life was like for them uh, before uh, they were in Christ. Excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2. Remember, formerly you the Gentiles in the flesh were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See, the middle wall of petitions broken down in this very language. You're going to bring your brethren. You're going to bring acceptable offerings. And dear friends, that reminds us of what the church is to be. You see, the church doesn't live by the standards of the world. The church may not apply worldly standards to those who will commune together in the midst of that visible body of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, the church is to be made up of all races and ethnic and cultural background people, all socioeconomic levels, all levels of economy blended together in the one body of Christ. This also means if Christ really does what we hope he does, that you're going to find yourself sitting by some unsavory people in the congregation. I think it'd be kind of great. There's the neighborhood prostitute. There's a drunk, a gambler. There's a guy that just got out of prison for assault. There's actually over there a person who wrestles with homosexuality. And we don't want them with us in our church, do we? Ah, oh, but listen. What did Paul say about them in 1 Corinthians 6? <laughs> After this sordid list, and such were some of you. That's what God's promising to do here. Not to bring clean Gentiles into the church, but to bring sinners who have been converted by the grace of God. And dear brothers, this is to be our goal as we think about the gospel ministry. But let's go on to the second place and see, not only do we have the goal, we've got confidence here because God promises to provide new covenant ministers or gospel ministers for the building and protecting of the new covenant church unto eternity. He, in verse 21, makes a provision for a new covenant ministry, a new order of ministers. I will also take some of them, the Gentile converts now, for priests and for Levites, says Jehovah. The great change is taking place. The priestly office, the, the priests, the Levites, are going to be replaced, and not simply by Jews as they were by the apostles, those first missionaries, but now from the church itself, from the Gentile churches. God is going to raise up a new order of gospel ministers for the sake of his church. In our Confession of Faith, chapter 25, paragraph 3, unto this Catholic visible church, Christ hath given the ministry, oracles and ordinances of God, for the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life to the end of the world, and doth by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. Now, what we see here is that as God brings the Gentiles to the church, and, and notice in verse 20 that there'll be no impediment. That's the strange thing about these animals. Horses, chariots, litters, mules, camels. We could say bicycles, motorcycles, cars, boats, planes. Um, some will get there quickly. Some will take their time. But there'll be no impediment for anyone who's elect to be brought into the church from whom God then will raise up this order of gospel ministers. God is going to provide now for his church, for her building, and for her protecting. He speaks then of the permanence of the new covenant church in verse 22. For just as the new heavens 
and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares Jehovah. So your offspring and your name will endure. You remember in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 20, God confirms the new covenant and the messianic promises by saying, if, God, if you can break my covenant for day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne, and with Levitical priests, my ministers. The stability of the created order in Jeremiah 31 and here in chapter 33 is used by God to prove the permanence of his promises and church. But now you notice it's not the physically created heavens and earth of which Isaiah speaks. No, he speaks now of new heavens and new earth. And we don't think about this in the first place as at the end of the age. What is God doing right now in this great work of redemption, in this great work of gathering the nations to himself? There's a permanence to it. It's as solid as the heavens themselves. The writer of Hebrews says it, it cannot be shaken, this kingdom of God that he has entrusted to us. It shall remain in the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. But notice as well something of the means of this permanence when he speaks at the end of that verse of covenant succession. So your offspring are your seed and your name will endure. Now God's going to gather the elect to himself from the nations through our missionary and gospel enterprises. But a faithful church will always grow more rapidly by covenant growth than by evangelism. It's common sense to stop and think about it for a moment. Let's say that we have the glory this next year of seeing uh, 10 young adults convert in God's providence. We had five men and five women, and of course five single men, five single women do what they normally do, and they pair off, and we now have five couples. But out of those five couples, we might have three, five, if you go to this church, eight or ten. Uh, children. And this is, what, this is how God grows his church through his church. And it's a very important part of manifesting the glory of God, of, of this great covenant enterprise. It's, it's the means, one of the principal means that God uses for the church to prevail and to prosper. And it reminds us who are parents of this glorious responsibility. We also have a goal in mind to present our little ones to God as acceptable grain offerings. And we have the means that God has given to this, but he calls us to this careful nurturing and disciplining and, and teaching of our children. You know, it's very important that you young ladies, mothers, realize this. There really is, it's not a truism, it's not some patriarchal way to put you in your place. There is no more glorious calling outside the gospel ministry than being a mother. Paul says that you're going to contribute to the salvation of the church through the bearing of covenant children. Machen and it talked about the fact that from his mother's knee, he knew more theology than the students who were coming to seminary. It's really true. The hand that rocks the cradle will rule the world. You ladies understand that. Great calling. As you well know, it's more than a full-time calling that God has given to you. But God is going to grow his church through the converts coming in, but through this covenant succession. But with the provision of ministers, with the promise of permanence, he also makes a provision for the means of grace. And so we see in verse 23... It shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says Jehovah. Again, we have these Old Testament figures of speech by which the prophets so often taught New Testament, uh, New Covenant reality. Here he talks about a succession of new moons and a succession of Sabbaths. I think he chose these two ordinances because they were the ordinances that were being exercised weekly and monthly in all the local congregations, the meeting houses, and the synagogues. 
And so now he's saying that the new covenant ministry with the people that God is gathering are going to have their regular weekly ordinance in the Sabbath. And that is going to continue with all of its provisions until the end of the age. Again, back to our confession of faith. God gave his ministry, oracles, and ordinances for the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life to the end of the world, and thus by his own presence and spirits, according to his promise, make them effectual there unto. And what's the response? As the ordinances are exercised from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh is really the word, will come to bow down before me, says Jehovah. Do you believe that? We're not talking about some pitiable minority, a thimble full of people here and one or two there. Look at the language, and Isaiah's full of this language. It's not just here. Chapter 2, chapter 11, straight through. He is saying now that as God builds this church with this new covenant ministry, that he is going to bring the great majority of the human race to the Lord Jesus Christ. To do what? To come to Christ, but notice, to come and bow down before God. See, evangelism not only is to declare the glory of God, it is to lead to worship. Psalm 96, verses 7 to 10. Ascribe to Jehovah, O families of the peoples, ascribe to Jehovah glory and strength, ascribe to Jehovah the glory of his name. Bring an offering. This is the gospel message. Bring an offering. Christ and the offerings we bring in him come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, Jehovah reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. You see this relationship then between our evangelism, our goals there, and the worship of God. You must not separate the two. This remarkable statement in Calvin. If it be inquired then by what things chiefly the Christian religion has a standing existence amongst us and maintains its truth, it will be found the following two not only occupy the principal place, but comprehend under them all the other parts. So what would you say are the two most important things that we involve, as we call, to define the church and and the gospel in Christ. He calls it the whole substance of creation, of Christianity. First, a knowledge of the mode in which God is duly worshipped. Secondly, the source from which salvation is to be obtained. Remarkable. Yet it's so true. When the church deviates in her worship, the gospel will be destroyed. Because the gospel is unto proper worship. And thus don't ever lose your zeal. The purpose of the church is to gather the elect that we all might bow together and worship the Lord our God. And then we have this very strange concluding section. And I call it the protection of the church. We've seen the provision of the gospel ministry. We've seen the permanence of the church. We see the provision of the ordinances, but now the permanent, the protection. Then they will go forth, and the they now are the gathered converts who have been brought into the church to worship the Lord God. They will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched. And there will be an abhorrence to all man. And we know that through the history of the church from the first century and through the early Roman Empire and many times in the world, today in China and North Korea and Iran and other Muslim countries in Cuba and Venezuela, how uh, Satan is breathing out fury against the church and seeking to, to destroy her. And God in his providence allows these things to go on for certain periods of time. And then he steps forward and he acts. Christ is on that white stallion. He's conquering. He's riding forth. And what this promise is, as gory as it might sound, is that it's it's language used in the prophets that when God defeats his enemies in judgment, the fields are strewn with their corpses. To show the great 
vengeance and power of God. And then he takes an example right from Jerusalem. Uh, the fires of the Valley of Hinnom, Topheth, where once people sacrificed their children, but it had turned into a perpetual burning garbage heap. A fire that never went out. Worms devouring the bodies and carcasses of what was there. Such vivid descriptions of judgment against those who transgress God. Perhaps an early fulfillment of this took place in 70 AD, when in fact the very reality of the corpses and the burning bodies was evident as the Christians, under the teaching of the Savior, fled Jerusalem to safety, that they would have looked on the bodies of those who had been their persecutors, those who had sought to destroy the church, not with glee, but with a certain worship that our God reigns and accomplishes all things. And of course, the language does bring us then to the end of the age, doesn't it? And our Savior takes this very verse to talk about hell in Mark 9, 48, they'll be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The worm of conscience for eternity, nagging at every rejected offer of the gospel, every kindness of God. And this unbearable physical and mental and spiritual torment described by far the closest that we can get to it for eternity. That's what awaits all transgressors, all who refuse Christ. Some of you here tonight perhaps have not forsaken your sins. Your conscience would bear witness to you right now that you are in the class of a transgressor. Or you might play a game. You might know the names, even among seminary students. Dear Dr. Scipione, uh, who died in the last year, was converted in seminary, and he always told seminary students about his testimony. But anyone here, see, the gospel is a two-edged sword. The gospel brings life to those who come to God on his terms. But the gospel is bringing death, painful, eternal death, judgment now and forever. Oh, dear friend, if you sit here tonight and you're not in Christ, there, there's breath in your body, there's yet time for you to turn from your sins. Because the opposite's also implied here. That if we're going to walk out and look on this, he's also promising then, in the protection of the church, the eternity of the church. Eternal bliss that we have to gaze upon the triune God through the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may need to remember, as Marcel will say, that the gospel must be preached with both messages of salvation, but also of damnation. We don't hear a lot about hell in our pulpits today. We need to warn people of what's coming. So what we have here is the goal and confidence of the New Covenant ministry. We have a a promise that God's going to gather the New Covenant Church from the nations. He's going to build and protect that church through a host of New Covenant ministers. The church is spread now throughout the world. Now this is to be your goal. It's the goal of all of us. We all get tired in our Christian walk. You get tired in your labors as a, a mother, a, a housekeeper, a worker, whatever it is uh, in a church that's so often beset with difficulties. Get your eye on this goal of what Christ is doing. When you begin to lag in your studies and you wonder, is this really worth it? Think about what Christ is going to do. What he'll do with you, what he does with us who are in the ministry. Now, we'll be the unnamed. The world will not recognize us and the church will soon forget us when we're gone, but God doesn't forget. No. We get this goal before you. When you enter the ministry, you let your goal be that Christ be glorified through your preaching, through your pastoring, through your evangelism. You be consumed with that, and you'll run the race well. And you'll finish the course that is set before you. And do it with confidence. Because it's God who does this work. It's not you. It's not I. It's obviously a supernatural work. Everything in this passage is of sovereign grace. 
But God continues to do that. And then, just take hold of Christ. In weariness, in worry, in frustration, in wanting to give up. Just take hold of Christ. Suck the life out of him by the Spirit. And plead with him to give you all that you need just to continue the course until that day when you'll stand before him and he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful promise that you have given to us, this declaration of the goal of the gospel and the confidence with which we can pursue it. May we be encouraged. Each of us here tonight is in his or her calling. Each of these students, they begin now another year. As we all soon take these vows, Lord, let us do so with an eye on you and for your glory and dependence upon you. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's stand at this time and sing together by grace alone.
is an occasion of celebration, but it's also an occasion in which we publicly make commitments that have to do with our vocation, our vocation as students and our vocation as faculty members. And so I'm going to call by name each of the students, and as I call your name, I'd like for you to stand, and then when we're all standing, you'll recite together these promises that you make. Jonathan Bartlett, Lucas Bombach, David Blizzard, Brendan Brannigan, Brendan Burns, David Chi, Miguel D'Azevedo, Silas Dimenezes, Alexander Dwyer, Timothy Freitag, Devin Gay, Joseph Gehrman, Kirk Gibbons, Zach Groff, Dale Hagwood, Eli Herzl, Adam Christofik, Mark Quo, Alex Mauger, Ethan McCarter, Lucas McCown, Natalia Moody, Joshua Morrison, Corey Page, Mateus Pereira, Vinicius Pimentel, Laney Price, Kenneth Puidak, Justin Salinas, Wesley Scheidt, Logan Shelton, Benjamin Selensky, Caleb Willingham, and Johan Z. Now I'd ask all of you students who are standing to recite together in unison the Student Covenant, which is printed in the program. Deeply impressed. be so by God's grace. Please be seated. Gentlemen, ladies, it is a privilege to address you this evening, and I invite you to open your Bibles on the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4, we will read from verse 9 through verse 12. Please give attention to the reading of God's word. Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to this to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we have instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Brethren, I believe all of us here love the brothers. We are in seminary, we teach at a seminary, we all come from good reformed churches, and so we believe that we have the love for the brothers in all of us. At least we should have. And so did the Thessalonians. As we see here, when Paul addresses them, he gives them a clear example of their love for the others. He says that they have been 
have had this loving attitude towards all the brothers in Macedonia. But then, Paul tells them to improve on their love. In fact, as we were reminded by Dr. Piper, it is much more difficult to improve on something than to begin it. So, as those who love the brothers, who love the church and its members, we urge you to improve on your love, or as Paul would say, to excel all the more in this love. But first, we need to answer a few questions. Can we do it? Can we improve on the way we love our brothers? Well, the answer is yes, but it's not because we are so good and we are so loving that we can love more and more. It is because, as Paul tells us, God taught us this love. And as in 1 John we see that the love for the brother is one of the marks of a true Christian, so we can also infer with this text as well that only a true Christian can love the brethren. And so because God himself taught the Thessalonians and we believe has taught us, we can improve in our love for the brothers. And so what is the charge for us? The charge is that we are to improve in the way we love others, our brothers in Christ, and also those outside the church. Can we do it? Yes, because God has taught us to do it. But how? How can we improve our brotherly love? How can we, students at a seminary, professors, members of the church, wives of students, how can you improve or excel all the more in your love for the other. Well, here Paul is telling you that it is by quietly minding your own business. <laughs> now, what does that mean? Well, read with me. Verse 10, we see an example of this love, and then in the end, Paul says, but we urge you, we urge you brothers, to do this more and more. The NASB says, excel in this all the more and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. This expression here, to aspire to live quietly, could be translated as make it your ambition. And so we see that Paul is using strong words. He's telling them, make an effort. Willfully, conscientiously try. To do what? To have no ambition. John Stott says that this is an oxymoron, that Paul is saying, make it your ambition to have no ambition. And this should, all, should be all of our ambition. And so, let me tell you, brethren, especially those in seminary studying, if you're here thinking that you're going to be the next RC's pro, Packer 2.0, you're in the wrong place. If you're here thinking that the church is lucky to have you, that you're really good at it, that you really love the other and you're a good preacher, you're in the wrong place. Make it your ambition to have no ambition, to live a quiet life, to live a peaceful life, to study as you are called to study peacefully, quietly. But then Paul goes on and he says, mind your own affairs. And you might think, wait a minute, as Christians, we have a duty to rebuke our brothers who are in sin and to care for them and to take a part in their lives and to join in with their sufferings and happiness, and that is true. But as Matthew Poole says, we are to endeavor into, into the affairs of others when we are called to and we must do so as they, are, or they were our own affairs. And so what does that mean is, yes, sometimes we are called to deal with others' business, but we should do that as it is our business. That means we cry their tears, we rejoice when they rejoice. We see their problem not as outsiders or judgmental people who know better, but we see their problems as those who have sympathy empathy, as those who might have the same problems. And then we are quietly minding our own business. And so the charge for us, the charge for those 
pursuing pastoral ministry is that we should quietly mind our own business. Now sometimes, and I've seen this happen, and this is a charge to myself, we have a tendency of acting like sniffing dogs looking for error or a error detector beeping any time we see something we think is a mistake. And then we make our snarky comments, we talk to our friends about it, we post it online. That's not what we're called to do. We're not supposed to work as the gatekeepers of heaven telling people who can get in and who cannot. It is not our job to do these things. Our job as those pursuing ministry is to preach Christ. Preach him, glorify him, and he will do all the rest. And we do it depending on his grace, on his power. We announce the good news of the gospel because it is a glorious reality based on God's strength. And so brothers, quietly mind your own business. Quietly mind your own business. Now, Paul finishes this section, not only telling us that this is how we love the brothers by quietly minding our own business, but he tells us why we should this, why we should do this, especially concerning those outside. And he says in verse 12, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. So what does that mean? Well, there's a famous phrase that says that the, the church is, I will paraphrase here, but the church is good enough except for the people in it? Well, there's a reason why this church, this phrase, this sentence is famous. Sometimes people inside the church don't live in a way that shows love for the brothers, love for the other. The commandment is not just to love those who you like or those who are in your church, it's to love thy neighbor. And the question is not who is your neighbor, but who are you a neighbor to? And so a good way to see if you're doing this is ask yourself, are you more bothered by your own sin or by the sin of others? Are you more, bo more bothered by your own mistakes or by what your neighbor does? Because if it is by what others, does, others do, then you should re rethink your whole attitude. So we are indeed called to love our neighbors. And as seminarians, we have a lot of business to care for. So we should be plenty busy taking care of our own business so that we would not become stumbling blocks to others. And Christ alone will be the stumbling block. So brethren, this is a charge. So I charge you and I charge myself. Let us love the brethren by quietly minding our own business. Thank you. We not only ask students to make public commitments on this evening, also all of us who serve as professors and members of the board of trustees who are able to attend will also publicly once again commit ourselves to the statement of belief and covenant found on the back of this program. I'd like to acknowledge the professors who are here this evening and the board members who are here this evening and ask them to stand. Dr. Piper, would you please stand? Dr. Dyer, would you stand? Dr. Bacchus, Dr. Curdo, Dr. McGraw, Dr. Morales, Dr. Cook, and Mr. Higgins. I'll read these statements on the back and then ask you to affirm your agreement with them. Here's what it says that we subscribe to every year. Believing that there is but one, the living and true God, and that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory, and with solemn awareness of the accountability to him in all that we feel, think, say, and do, we engage in and subscribe to this declaration. All scripture is self-attesting and being truth requires the human mind wholeheartedly to subject itself in all its activities to the authority of scripture, complete as the word of God, 
standing written in the 66 books of the Holy Bible, all therein being verbally inspired by Almighty God, and therefore without error in the original autographs. Reformed theology as set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger and shorter catechisms as adopted by the Presbyterian Church in America is the system of doctrine taught in Scripture and therefore is to be learned, taught, and proclaimed for the edification and government of Christian people, for the propagation of the faith, and for the evangelization of the world by the power of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we do solemnly promise and engage not to inculcate, sanction, teach, or insinuate anything which shall appear to us to contradict or contravene, either directly or implicitly, any element in that system of doctrine. Now therefore, we in the presence of God state and signify that we consent, agree, and bind ourselves to all of the foregoing without any reservation whatsoever, and that we further obligate ourselves immediately to notify in writing the Board of Trustees should a change of any kind take place in our belief and feeling not in accord with this statement. Amen. Brothers, do you assent to this? If you do, say I do. I do. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the blood of the everlasting covenant through which we are sanctified. And we thank you for calling us out of darkness into your light that we may proclaim your praises. We ask that we would decrease, that Christ would increase, and we pray that your spirit would continue to stir up our affection and love for the Savior conforming us to his will in everything we set our hands to. Forgive us for all the ways in which we have sinned against you in heart, speech, and behavior. And we pray that you would give us humble hearts as we begin this new semester, that we would not only come to fill our minds with knowledge, but we would remember that you are incomprehensible, and that we would be humbled, and that we would grow in grace even as we study. We ask, Lord, that you would use us for the furthering of the gospel of Christ, for the conversion of many out of this world, and to see your blessing in reviving our churches and to see the lost brought into her doors. We thank you, Lord, for this evening and for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for our new president, and we thank you for our former president, and we ask for your blessing on these men and upon all who labor among us. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please rise and sing, Be Thou My Vision. Yeah. 